All right. Well, so um, I have my basic five questions that I like to kind of anchor me with the podcast, but I have, you know, I know I want to talk to you a lot about your story because I feel like not only your diagnosis story, but your cancer journey, I think is a really important to kind of your own sense of self realization, kind of figuring out what was going on with your brain and your life. Um, But why don't we start out uh, with, you know, when were you diagnosed with ADHD and kind of what was happening in your life? What were some of those signs where you were like, I really need to, I really need to get this looked at. (laughs) I need to look into this. So that's a complicated answer. I know, right? It is me because ADHD, 16 stories popped to mind. I'll start at the end. And the end is in the spring of this past year, I decided to be tested. I had never been tested for ADHD. I'm 56 years old. And I got tested because I'm an ADHD productivity coach. And I got tired of saying to people, oh, I have undiagnosed ADHD. And they thought, whatever they thought. And I just kind of thought, it's clear I have it. So what triggered the knowledge? What triggered the knowledge was having chemo brain at age 50, right after I'd been through cancer treatments. And it really affected my brain cancer treatments, chemo treatments for cancer. So I had chemo treatments, radiation, her septin, I got the whole Megillah. The good news is, is I had early stage one breast cancer. So they knew exactly what they needed to do to get rid of it. So that's the upside. The downside was, unfortunately, I had all of it. I didn't have the mastectomy. I was very lucky. I did actually get away with having a lumpectomy and um, delighted. I also am negative for the BRCA gene. So for people in breast cancer world, we'll understand all of that. Uh, Those are being very positive things. Yeah. And what happened with the brain was I couldn't remember words. I didn't know where I was going, what I was doing, how to get anything done. It was absolutely crippling. And thought, this doesn't seem like it's just chemo brain. Now, the other thing people who have dealt with breast cancer will know is that you end up having to shut down your hormones if you are uh, positive in the hormone department. And I was. So I was triple positive. I was positive for estrogen, progesterone, and HER2 new, which meant they were doing a fast shutdown of my hormones. I was 50, so I actually was well into perimenopause borderline menopause, but the shutdown is pretty quick. They put you on meds and they knock it out of your system. And so there was this horrible sort of triple play of chemo brain, undiagnosed and completely unaware ADHD and, you know, hormones being shut down. So it all just resulted in a nightmare. And one of the things I didn't talk about much then but I'm certainly open about it today is that there were times in my life I had dealt with anxiety and depression. So I had been through therapy for years for anxiety and depression and have since talked to the therapist and found out, oh yeah, he thought I might have ADHD, but didn't think that was something we should deal with. And I have words, I won't use them, but knowing now what I know five, six years later, I really think it's a shame because it would have been very helpful to me, even as an adult, to have had that diagnosis and started working with it. I'm a firm believer that trauma, anxiety, and ADHD can go hand in hand because, of course, kids who are neurodiverse, neurodivergent, I get them confused, but I think it's kids who are neurodiverse hear 20,000 more negative messages by the age of 12 than kids who are not. And of course, I was one of those kids. I mean, you could look at my report card and just, it it screams ADHD. So I then went on kind of a brain journey. What am I going to do next? And I did take medication for the depression, which was caused by cancer slash chemo. They'll say it was cancer. I say it was chemo. Chemo was chemical. I think it messed with brain waves and put me into a depression. I think walking around with brain fog probably has a big chunk to do with depression too it was so frustrating to be super smart and I am 2E, uh, twice exceptional, gifted and ADHD. So I went on like a brain journey and I started looking into how could I learn more about ADHD and executive function. All this was happening at the exact same time as my daughter was entering sixth grade math 
and really being challenged and showing executive function struggles. So ding, 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 like daughter, like mother, she didn't get tested till the summer. <laughs> so I didn't get, we just both kind of just said we're executive functioning issued people. We just have some executive function challenges. And I didn't want to believe I had ADHD. I'm not sure why I was in denial for so long. I kind of get over myself. I'm not sure. I guess I wanted to be different, uh, even more different than I already am. Right. Well, sometimes our ADHD gets in the way of us even getting the diagnosis, you know, <laughs> like there's a lot of steps involved and you're usually we're busy and exhausted and doing a million other things that sometimes just even getting the official diagnosis can kind of fall down the, the to-do list. Right. And that was the case. And I think in addition to me sort of being in a denial about it, but I recognized that over the years I had put systems in place. I knew how to, what I call managing me. I knew how to manage me. I didn't know me was ADHD and I was managing ADHD. I just was managing me. And what did that look like? I'll give you a quick story. Uh, I'd gotten my first home, which was a one bedroom apartment in New York City. This is many years ago. I was about 28 years old. And when I purchased it, I had to take my first mortgage. And I knew that I struggled with paying bills. And I just thought that was a fluke about me. And so I was a nervous wreck about it. So I said, here's what I'm going to do. I get a bonus. I worked in Wall Street at the time. So I get a bonus and don't get all excited. It wasn't a huge bonus, but it was a bonus. And what I would do is I went to the bank and I said, now remember people, this is way before automated bill paying and everything else. I said, is there a way we can set up a savings account and I'll put the money in at the beginning of the year to pay my mortgage and it will just auto pay from here. And the banks said, I had the mortgage at the same bank. They set the whole thing up. So I'd put all the money in before January 1st, have it ready to go for the next year's mortgage. And it just paid because I was so stressed out about the responsibility of paying a mortgage. Now, I mean, we kind of laugh at that, but if you're in ADHD land, that is a serious concern because we forget to pay bills. We don't mean to. It's not that we don't have the money in the account. We just forget to pay them. Yeah, I had the same issue with student loans. I, you know, um, by the time I was in my second year of university, I was getting, I was old enough because I had dropped out of school so many times that I was old enough that I was no longer considered a dependent on my parents. And so they were giving me much bigger student loans and that, you know, I would get this huge chunk of money in September that I had to dole out for rent and food and, um, you know, all of these lifestyle, uh, you know, payments throughout the year. And it was terrifying. It was the same way. Yeah. Like I really wished I had had somebody take that money and do, do exactly what you had done. I worked in wall street. So I was actually around financial stuff and my dad is really good at finances. So I also kind of had that dad pressure of knowing that I needed to make sure I didn't mess up. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was funny. My mom was an accountant too. And so I always, I think she sort of thought I would, I would come by it naturally. And, um, I was a disaster when it came to money and budgeting and, and all of that stuff. But, uh, I loved accounting as like a subject, you know, like I loved math and I loved accounting as a subject. It was just when it came to real life, um, it was just, it was very easy to kind of put off and not think about. Now that's interesting because I'm the opposite. I am not a math person. I'm not an accounting person. I hated accounting in business school. However, when I went into classes like market research, we applied accounting and then I totally got it and it all made sense. So I'm very much a sort of visual and doer. And I really struggle with anything that's a process, which is ironic because I'm a productivity coach, but that's because I've had to learn how do I set up processes to manage me? So now I can teach them to other people, but math is all like a process. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember that whole parentheses first multiplication. I can't even remember the formula anymore. And that's the way we saw our daughter's ADHD was seeing her struggle in like early algebra and the processes. And it was like, ding, 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 ding. And also not only that kind of looks like an executive function challenge, but that looks kind of familiar. I kind of remember being that person. Yeah, right. I remember uh, admitting to my children that the only time I ever cheated on a test in uh, middle school and high school was math tests when you had to remember formulas because I just never could. And so I would write the formula in pencil on the inside of my Texas Instruments calculator cover. <laughs> 
<laughs> and then as soon as I got into the test, I would write all the formulas on the back of the paper and then I would erase the Texas Instruments calculator so I didn't get caught. But yeah, that wow. was the only time I would, the only time I cheated, even though I was like a lousy student in many ways, there were the only time I ever cheated was, was when it came to math formulas. Like I just couldn't remember those. I think, I don't think they make you remember them anymore. I think finally somebody realized that that was a terrible thing to do, but it really kind of depends. Yeah. Um, she just bumped into this with her chem test and was uh, very frustrated because he didn't give the formulas that he normally does. And of course, he's darling. He saw her and he said, I know what you're going to say. You can just retake the test. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to help you through this. And <laughs> it was great. And just in the moment, she still hasn't learned. Like in the moment, she needs to say, Mr. Teacher, I need to, I, I, I can't do this test this way. You know, my 504 is going to require me to need X, Y, Z. Now, mm -hmm. interestingly, the beauty of this was we found out the 504 actually doesn't require visual study methodologies. And so we are meeting while well, the whole team is meeting next Friday and we're going to put that in place. Hmm, okay. as her original 504 was just for anxiety and so it had a different kind of flavor to it but now I'm realizing like oh hello mom right I'm in the world of ADHD you think I would have looked at this but I never even thought about it I'm like well, sure her accommodations are fine not a problem right <laughs> actually yeah. no they're not fine uh, so just to backtrack a little bit back to the your experience with chemo brain because I know a lot of us you know something happens in our life when we're when we're diagnosed in adulthood something happens that kind of derails you where you're like what is going on um, I'm not able to cope I'm not able to remember like I used to you know like there's always something uh, you know where you feel like you're kind of imploding and and I know chemo brain is something that happens to a lot of women because of the estrogen fluctu fluctuations um, but then again, you know, when you are diagnosed with ADHD, a lot of us look back throughout our entire life and see, okay, the signs were there all along. And this is really just sort of peaks and troughs when it comes to my executive <laughs> functioning. So like when you think about chemo brain, do you think chemo brain only happens to women who are neurodivergent to begin with? Or do you feel like chemo brain is just one of those things that can look like ADHD? I mean, how do you even like, like I always think of my guest, Emily Donahoe, who talks about the fish hooks, you know, it's like when you're trying to figure out what is the source of these executive functioning issues, it just feels like you're pulling out a pile of fish hooks to like, how do you even begin to, in your brain research, how do you even begin to decide like, what is what? You know what? I wish I really had a, a scientific <laughs> answer to that question, I know, right? and I don't. And I want to make that really super clear because I'm fascinated by this. This is like my thing that I am going after and trying to understand. And so I'm going to say in a I've witnessed kind of way. Mm -hmm. Brain fog, I think, is what you're talking about, which is similar to chemo brain, but brain fog can show up for ADHD women as we're losing our estrogen because our estrogen has been the little engine that could that helped us skate along that kind of replaced the things we're missing like dopamine, et cetera. And I'm not, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not gonna say this well. So as I'm looking at this, I'm seeing these interplays of all these different things, at least in my life, what I've been through and what I'm seeing through some of my clients. You know, there's gonna be a link, we're gonna find out people are scientifically researching this now. There's even going to be a link between trauma, childhood trauma and ADHD. And, you know, what is that link? We don't really know. But ADHD kids, if they're getting 20,000 more negative messages, they are in some ways been, have been dealing with little t traumas all their life. So, okay, I feel like this is a two-part question. So part one is... I would say brain fog can come up, whether it's chemo brain. And so for me, chemo brain was the trigger, right? That's what derailed me enough that I said, I have no idea what to do next. There must be something more here. And then you can have that brain fog from, from hormones. And that can show up um, when you're pregnant. It can show up at any time where your hormones are fluctuating in a different kind of way. But as you lose that estrogen, your brain is just not going to work the same. I'm not, I'm not saying that as an absolute. I'm saying that can be the case if you've got ADHD, that your brain is not working the same as it did before when you had the estrogen to sort of help you mask those symptoms. 
It was sort of like that little icing on the cake that, you know, if there was something wrong with the cake, you could kind of hide it with a little extra icing, right? That's kind of like what estrogen is for women. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what makes it so confusing for all of us when we do go to our medical professionals and they're like, no, it's probably more likely just this. But then when you're told it's just this over and over and over again through the course of your life, oh, it's just a new baby. Oh, it's just pregnancy. It's just, uh, you know, um, perimenopause. It's just like, oh, you're just depressed. You know, like it just feels like, the, at some point you start connecting the dots and realizing that this has been a lifelong experience of being told, oh, you just have to do this and, and feeling like you're throwing darts at the wall and nothing seems to be um, helping. Uh, And then suddenly this magical diagnosis of ADHD comes along where you, it really starts to like, it feels like this foundational diagnosis of everything else that was seemingly random in your life. And I think that's why it's such a profound experience for so many of us when we're diagnosed, especially well into adulthood. I agree. And it really um, put a lot of the pieces in place. I already knew, I knew I had ADHD when I filled that form out and got ready for my um, ADHD diagnosis. I mean, just reading the card, uh, the credit cards, the report cards, still stuck on that mortgage, aren't I? The report cards uh, and reading the comments the teachers had made. And I really only looked from sixth grade to 12th grade to see what they said. And the comments were things like easily distracted, gets in own way, could be a, a capable student who could be exceptional if she just applied herself loses her notes and notebooks, turns in assignments late. Does this all sound kind of familiar? Because this is what it all said. And there was a part of me that really had to grieve because little known story, I wanted to be a national honors student. I wanted to be a national honor society. And my grades just weren't there because I hadn't had the kind of tutoring, et cetera, that I needed. And before anyone throws my parents under the bus, nobody knew about ADHD. They did not know. They, we just didn't have that knowledge. And I don't in any way ever blame my folks for not knowing. They just didn't know. They just, you know, you're being lazy or whatever. It was just different times. Now we're so much more clued in. Um, just to go back to my daughter for a second, she is in National Honor Society because we do know when I was able to advocate for her and get her the people she needed to be able to do very well academically. And it's very interesting to me that, I mean, and how much I've evolved. I would think like 10 years ago, I would have been so jealous. And now I'm just like, how great is that? That was the most awesome thing ever to watch her go up and get that and fulfill a dream that I had as a kid that I didn't get. So before you all say, oh, wow, you're so together. When I read that report card and got all those things ready and put them into that ADHD diagnosis sheet, I was a wreck. I really had to mourn losing that kid who didn't get what she needed. But Mm. once I did that, then it was like, oh, well, this makes sense. And it answered all the questions, all the, why was stuff so challenging for me? Why was it such a struggle? And that's a gift, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I had a very similar experience. I cried when I went back to look at my report cards because what was very sad for me too, was I was, I was entered the gifted program in the third grade and my kindergarten and first and second grade report cards were very positive. She's a natural leader. She's, you know, like all of these very talkative, very like enthusiastic, always, you know, you know, and then there would be the odd, like her handwriting needs to, we need to work on her neatness and her handwriting. Um, but for the most part, it was like all of these positive, um, comments about how enthusiastic and and motivated I was. And then I sort of saw this slow decline over the years as teachers just picked and picked and picked at all the things I wasn't good at. You know, like she's so, you know, she's easily distracted. All the things you said, easily distracted, you know, can't be in groups. They always had to remove me from groups because I would be too chatty. And so like slowly I was like, my desk would end up getting moved all the way to the teachers, you know, to sit next to the teacher. And like, I just saw Saw this poor girl over the years really giving up on herself. Mm. And so by the time I was in high school, I didn't, I knew something was odd. Like I knew I was bright, but I just couldn't, 
you know, I just couldn't do it. And, and so I stopped going and then you would see the absences. Right. And then it was like these, you know, then it would be like needs to hand in reports. Then I just wasn't even trying at that point. And it just, that's what made me cry was how much I had given up on myself and how nobody really knew how to help me back then. So yeah, like when I think about being a parent and the ways in which I am able to kind of shift my perspective and really help and advocate for my children who suffer from the same issues with executive function and memory and all of the things that I had. Um, yeah, it is. It's, it's lovely. Like it really feels very empowering to be, to be able to take that knowledge and that self-knowledge and everything that your whole life has kind of led up to this point where you're like, now I can, um, help these children in a way. I mean, there's still that part of me that has that anxiety where I'm like, what am I not seeing? <laughs> you know, mm. because there was so much that was not seen in my childhood. Uh, but still, I think, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. It is, there's, it's, it's a really lovely feeling to be able to help your kids in the way that you weren't helped for sure. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great, I'm getting moment. very emotional. It's very, it was right? really, I, know. Right? <laughs> I mean, we do. Um, yeah, there is that grief is, um, I think there's it, I think you can take it and make some really positive changes in your own life. And, and it's, I mean, I talk a lot on this podcast just about like how incredible it's been to be able to kind of recognize my strengths as opposed to who I used to be, which was somebody who just always felt, thought I was the problem. And so, um, yeah, I, you know, but I think it is important to acknowledge uh, a lot of that, you know, that initial sadness of like wh how, what your life could have been. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, uh, onward, <laughs> right. Um, I really want to hear about how you ended up becoming a productivity coach. So, so you were in, um, New York in your twenties working near or on wall street. So were you right. in finance at one point? Yeah, I was in, I worked for AIG and then I worked for various firms, the New York stock exchange and did a whole career in the financial world. It was fascinating. I loved it. It was great until I didn't. And yeah, multi-career ADHD or right here we go. So then I went off and started my own trading firm and traded for myself, which was a disaster and not my superpower at all. And I got out fairly quickly after three years. I said, I just got to get out of this. It doesn't work. And had met my husband at that point. And I guess we were newlyweds or just about to get married. I'm not sure which. And I said, I really have always wanted to go to design school. So I went to design school and I went into commercial office design, which I absolutely loved. And I found that I loved working with clients in office business. I didn't ever really want to decorate Mrs. Jones's house with fluffy pillows and uh, uh, draperies. I was much more into, you know, desks and where we could lay them out and which department should be seated where and all that kind of stuff. And so productivity became a natural evolution out of this. And I went to study under Barbara Hemphill to become a certified productive environment specialist, which is basically someone who helps clients set up a productive environment, whether that's a larger corporation and we go in and do a day or whether that is um, an individual and we do organizing. And of course, what happened was the pandemic happened and I was already like morphing towards productivity consulting and I was on what I called a three-year plan to become a laptop business. And it was my plan to be an online consultant. Well, that plan went from three years to three months because of course I had no choice. I couldn't go out and help offices organize their space anymore because no one was going to their offices, one. And two, they sure didn't want me there. You know, this is even before masks. So, and by masks, I mean like literally the ones we were wearing, <laughs> pandemic, not masking, which is a whole other topic. So- I uh, looked into a couple of coaching programs and really had been told about a program called Coach Approach for Organizers, which is really now more Coach Approach for people who are into organizing productivity and neurodiversity. <laughs> they just haven't changed their name yet. And I don't know if they will or won't. And I started that in June of 2020. And I have pretty much been in school while working while everything a mom does in family life. And I am a sandwich generation. So I'm not only dealing with a teenager who's looking at colleges, I'm also dealing with seniors who are starting to need more doctor appointments and things like this. God bless them. And uh, so it's been a little nutty <laughs> to say the least, 
but it's been great. And I am finishing up now. I should have my certification for coaching. I'm applying for it on April 1st. So I should have it hopefully by the end of the summer. It's been an incredible ride. I've learned a ton. While I was in it, they were morphing over to include a neurodiversity certification. So that's what I will graduate with is a certificate in neurodiversity coaching. Oh, incredible. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, I I've feel got like... the productivity background already. Right. You know, partly from having studied with productive environment, partly managing me. So I didn't feel I needed to get the productivity designation. I thought it'd be better to get the neurodiversity designation. Mm -hmm. So and what that's have, my clientele. What have you noticed is different when you talk about productivity with somebody who is neurotypical versus somebody who is neurodivergent? Because I feel like that word is very different <laughs> uh, to to different people in terms of like what even is productivity? What how, what are some of the differences you've noticed? Well, and it's been a long time since I worked with neurotypical people on productivity because my whole world now is neurodiversity. Um, I would really say no matter what, an individual is an individual and we are unique. We need different ways of setting up our time, schedule, productivity, you name it, space, environment, all of it. And, in, you know, I think that can even vary amongst neurotypical people. Uh, with neurodivergent folks, we need um, to recognize if it's already working, don't try to fix it. I can't tell you how often I'll have someone say, oh, I'm using this planner, but I really want to move over and use Asana. And I'm like, do you really? Is that what you really want? And then, you know, six weeks later, oh, I hate Asana and I'm never using it again. I'm going back to my planner. Mm-hmm because it wasn't broken. So don't fix it. So if you've got something that's really working for you already, I don't want to come in and say, you must use this program. You must go this direction because people are so different. I mean, we wouldn't have what a hundred different types of project management software if we were all the same, whether we're neurodivergent or neurotypical, right? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I think um, I think we are more, I think if you are neurodivergent, you have sort of grown up with this sense that everybody else got the manual, but you, right? So it makes sense that by the time you're an adult, when everybody says, this is the thing that works, you will want to try it, right? Because there's some part of you that never trusts what works for you because you've sort of, you know, like you said, like you've been told myriad times throughout your life that what works for you, even though it's working for you is still wrong. And I think that's where we get to that questioning part where we're like, we don't even understand, you know, I think it's almost like this, this knee jerk reaction for us to go with what everybody else says is working. And, and, and also I think there's these sort of impulsive part of us that like chases the excitement of something new. And like, you, like, you know, even if something is working for us, we have a tendency <laughs> to be like, oh, but I want to see if this thing is going to work better. Right. I mean, right. Like we're Shiny. Such, right. So it's I want like, it. There's that part of the follow the dopamine part where we're like, oh, it's so new and exciting. And, and I think we get really fixated on like perfection uh, because we're such puzzle solvers. So it's always fascinating to me to think about like all of the different elements to an ADHD brain that lead to, you know, why we are the way we are when it comes to organization and productivity. And um, I, I can yeah. give you a perfect example. Oh, good. I was six years with Asana. Loved Asana, great project management software, worked for my brain. I could color code it. I could do all these great things with it. It was wonderful until I just stopped using it. And that was a disaster because I need something to help keep me on track on projects and tasks and everything else. And so I then went on a journey to figure out what it was that I wanted to use. Now, the plus is I've seen a lot of project management softwares because I did, went on this little six month oh my gosh, what am I going to use journey? And so that's great for my clients, but it wasn't so great for me. And I landed on Todoist, which ironically is so much like Asana, you wouldn't even believe. Uh, and I've been with Todoist very happily for several years and it's great, but it's just a funny thing to see how we can go off in that direction and check out so many things. And it's a plus in some ways, right? Because we have a lot of knowledge about a lot of things, but it's a minus because then it takes us off track from using what's already really working for us. Mm -hmm. 
And I also feel like with productivity, I think that's something that we could, I mean, we have a tendency to burn ourselves out, right? Because we are so hyper productive in, in a lot of ways, even though we tend not to look at ourselves in that way, we tend to actually view ourselves as being lazy and procrastinating. Like when you really right. like sort it out and look at the timeline, I feel like we get so much more done. Um, you know, it might be in these small bursts at midnight, but at the same time, like, how do you even sort of know, I guess what my question is like, how much is too much when it comes to productivity? Like, I almost oh feel God, like okay. you have to learn how to balance, right? Like, I have like six directions I can go, oh, squirrel. Okay, <laughs> so I'll start with direction one, which is, and I'll, I'll hold it to two, uh, is we need to have a sense of our best times of the day. Mm -hmm. When are we really good at focusing and when are we not? I am a morning person. I am great first thing in the morning. This is when we're recording this. And I am like on fire, ready to go. The afternoon, I slump very badly. It is not my strongest point of the day. And so what I do is at the end of my workday, like 3, 30, 4 o'clock. And this, by the way, is also related to transitions as I go and take my walk, my power walk. I walk about one and a half to two miles. I'm trying to get back up to two miles. I'm very excited about that. And that becomes my transition to the evening to family time. And it also gives me a second burst of energy because exercise helps us with that, which is great. If you're, um, if you're the hyperactive type and I'm, or the combined type, I'm combined type, then exercise is really key because it helps us focus. Some folks focus uh, best if they exercise first thing in the morning, but because that's just my time of day where I'm super focused anyway, I know that I can put exercise a little later and get that second boost. Um, I should also say about this that I actually am not medicated. I opted not to be. I am totally pro-medication. I think it's great. I have no issue with it. I just felt like I'm 56 years old. I take a lot of other medications in the post-cancer world. Um, so my medication is eating healthy, getting a good night's sleep, exercising and recognizing 100% all my clients are on medication. I have no issue with it whatsoever. Just have opted not to take it myself. Um, so that was part one was this idea of knowing your biorhythms. What time of the day are you most on fire? And then put the stuff that's most important that your brain work into that time of day the stuff that's not your brain work, like maybe uh, paying bills or you know making a few calls or whatever, I put into the afternoon where I don't need to be on fire. Um, second piece of this, and it's really my mantra, it's what I leave, live by. In order for us to be truly productive, we need to learn how to be intentionally unproductive. Mm. which is very weird for a productivity coach, so stay with me. Oh, I where There's intentional you are going to burn out. You, whoever you are, all of us will burn out. We get exhausted. We get tired. And then what do we do? We pull out our phones and we play Candy Crush or we mindlessly sit in front of the TV or we doom scroll Facebook. And that is not being intentionally unproductive. So it's far better to recognize during that downtime, right? What am I doing? I'm being intentionally unproductive. I'm going for a power walk outside, fresh air, seeing a friend, walking her dog. We do that together. It's so much fun. Big, great Dane. And now I'm using that time to reset and enjoy myself and honor that I have needs, that I need self-care. So Whatever that self-care looks like for you, that could be a yoga class. I have a friend who's taking Qigong. Actually, that's one of my clients who's taking Qigong. Be intentionally unproductive. If you're taking a day off, take a day off. Shut off the phone. Turn it off. Don't look at it. Don't take your emails. I know this is really hard, but you can do it for a few hours and go off and do something really fun for the day. You will come back to work with a thousand times more energy because you completely shut down. And, you know, eventually you want to try to work up to doing that for an entire week, <laughs> which is even harder if you're running your own business, but it is doable. And I have done it. Yeah. It huge difference. No, I, I completely agree. And just to go back to the time 
um, like blocks, you know, I, I think that's been incredibly helpful for me to, when I really stopped and thought about like, when am I most likely to do this type of work? Right. So I'm like, it's the same, like early in the morning, I am just a buzz. And that is when I get all of my like to-do list, like the easy stuff. I'm just like, boom, 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 get it all off. And, um, and then I, I, I walk my dog at like three o'clock when I, when I'm feeling that slump, I do the exact same thing and not because, um, you know, it's, it's, it is, you're right. It's a nice transition from that into the evening. And then I know that in the evening, my brain has quieted down. And so that's when there's certain types of things I do better in the evening. So I like, wait, I don't try to do those earlier in the day. Like, so, so again, it's like really trying to stop and think like, what am I most you know, when is, when is this task best, you know, serving me throughout the day and kind of trying to place it into these time blocks. But again, that comes with an enormous amount of privilege being an entrepreneur and not having a nine to five job where you have to sit at a debt. Like I realize that there's a lot of freedom that my, you know, my life allows that kind of freedom. Um, but I will say yeah. even in corporate, you can make this work. You can say, cause I have a corporate client. And one of the things I've encouraged her to do is to not check email first thing in the morning. Mm. And she was very nervous about this. So what she did was she created a separate like little dinging noise on her computer for when her CEO contacts her. So no matter what, she has to be available for the CEO, but she doesn't check email before 10 o'clock in the morning. So she can get some focus time in and some work done because she works in HR and it's all day long with the emails and the phone calls and she's never out of meetings. So that is one way you can manage that in corporate is to say, I'm not going to be available. And listen, you put an autoresponder in your email that says, I'll be checking my email at 10 a.m. It's, it's, you know what? Here's the thing. We have all allowed everybody to run all over our boundaries. It is an age in which people can reach us 24-7 and they expect it. My clients don't expect it because I just set that boundary right up front. They, I'm not chit chatting with them on the weekend. I mean, if really something urgent came up, I would be available, but that's pretty, I, that has yet to happen since I've gone into coaching. You know, we, we draw the parameters and the boundaries around what we need. And if we have a brain-based challenge, it's even more mission critical that we do it, that we set these boundaries. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is, especially if you're an entrepreneur, I don't, it's a little trickier to do a corporate, but you can definitely do this as an entrepreneur. I only see clients Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. Wednesdays are crazy for me. There's always a whole bunch of trainings and meetings, et cetera. And then on Fridays, it's my strategy day. It's the day that I do all the intensive work that I may or may not have been able to get to during the week because I've been in constant meetings. I mean, I can be in five or six Zoom meetings a day. That's definitely something that happens in my world. So that's why I try to chunk them into Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, so that I have some Wednesday afternoon time for a few hours where I can really focus in. And then also on Fridays. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so now looking back at your own ADHD, what, what are some of the things that you feel like it's helped you with in, in your own life? What are some of the things you love most about it? Uh, the creativity mm -hmm. and uh, that whole research aspect. It's easy to go down the rabbit hole, right? On the research thing. And yet it's one of my favorite things to do. I love to learn. I am finding at my age that I have to learn differently. Uh, I look back and wonder how I was an English literature major and how I did a thousand pages of reading a week because now I find that agonizing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my learning I do from listening to podcasts. And actually I listened, I have to tell you about a story around one of the podcasts I listened to of yours. Um, so it's, you know, it's learning those techniques and figuring them out and then just running with them. But I love that part of ADHD. I love uh, being different. I, I enjoy the creativity of it. I enjoy the highs when you just have a ton of energy and you can just go, go, go. I always have to remember that we're going to have to schedule a little time to drop over at the end of that because we burn out. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line. It's really easy for an ADHD -er to burn out because we forget and we're in that hyper focus and we're going and we're so excited. That comes sometimes means that we can be late for things, <laughs> which I've really tried to work on. 
but I think I think my ADHD has allowed me to become an, an interesting person. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you just remind me of like, I, I, I try not to be late to things. I'm actually pretty prompt. Um, or usually I'm, I'm terribly early because I have such a bad eye, sense of time. But like, there are so many times where I will do something just before I leave the house where I'm like, oh, I have plenty of time to mop the kitchen floor before I leave. And then that's what ends up being late. So it just made me laugh. That um, makes me laugh. And it's true. So I have to tell you this thing that I learned on your podcast, because I never knew this. And I'm fascinated. Again, I'm fascinated by this. I have TMJ. So one of your uh, people you were interviewing, and I apologize, I've for- forgotten her name, but she was a lovely young lady from Scotland. She uh, was talking with you about TMJ. And I guess that's something that can come up with ADHD. I would love to know more about that. Do you remember? Oh, well, I think it was my own experience with, with, um, uh, teeth grinding. So, you know, teeth grinding right. is something that is very common with people with, who have ADHD and carry a lot of anxiety and tension. And so I think we teeth grind and we, and we clench our jaws during the day, but I always had been a really bad teeth grinder at night. night. And so my dentists over the years would say, you really should, you know, your molars are, are seeing a lot of wear and tear. You should wear, um, mouth guards. And I would go to the drugstore. I would get a mouth guard, you know, one of the -the over-the-counter mouth guards. And I would, you know, you, you chomp down on these mouth guards on your molars and I could never keep them in my mouth. I'd always spit them out. They were very uncomfortable. And it was just sort of, I would go through life like this. And then, um, several years ago, I started just out of nowhere, started getting vertigo And it got really bad. I would have these like attacks seemingly out of nowhere that I just like would, I couldn't open my eyes. If I would open my eyes, I would immediately just vomit. Like it was just awful. I couldn't drive my kids anywhere. I, it it was really debilitating. And I kept going to the ENT because I've always sort of had allergies and sinus issues. And so I thought it was sinus related. And so the ENTs were like, yeah, um, you know, you should take a diuretic. You need to give up caffeine. You need to give up chocolate. You need to give up alcohol. You have to have on be under a thousand milligrams of sodium a day. And I was like, wow. just kill me. I couldn't like, Where's I couldn't. The fun of that? Well, exactly. I was like a thousand milligrams of sodium sounds like a lot, but it's nothing. Like I couldn't eat in a restaurant anymore. Um, and giving up coffee was awful. Um, and And I also, it seemed like I, it got rid of the um, vertigo, but I was getting really, really bad tinnitus or tinnitus, however you want to pronounce it. And it was getting to the point where I was, couldn't hear anymore. I was getting fitted for hearing aids. I was so depressed because, uh, you know, tinnitus is just, it's really isolating and depressing. I couldn't think I couldn't have conversations with people. I couldn't have any ambient noise. Um, It was a really dark time. And I just felt like, I don't know what, you know, I, I, and even the audio audiologist was saying like, you know, a hearing aid is really not going to help with what you need help with. Like they were basically like, there's nothing we can do for you. And then I went to a routine visit with my dentist, a hygienist, and was telling her about all these issues I had. And she said, it sounds to me like you might have TMJ. She's so she's, and that was, and I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And it was just this light bulb moment where the dentist came in and he was like, I have a feeling what's happening is you're, you're chomping down on these, um, mouth guards, the jaw, the uh, mandibular joint is jamming up into your ear canal. And that is what is creating all of these issues. So they did this x-ray, the 360 x-ray of my jaw. Sure enough, my jaw had been just, you know, that joint was jammed right in there because of all my teeth grinding. And so he said, you know, all you need is this, like, I'm going to give you this like special kind of bite plate that you're going to wear for six months. And he said all of, you know, he was like, you're going to be able to eat pizza again. You can drink coffee. You can everything, your life will go back to normal. And I was like, (laughs) who do I believe? Yeah. But in that moment, I was like, who do I believe these ENTs and audiologists who are assuring me that this is a chronic, I was diagnosed with chronic Meniere's disease. They were like, this is it. This is your life. 
Um, and then the dentist who was like, oh, no, 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 it's fine. We'll just fix it really quickly. And <laughs> I was like, all right, I think I'm going to go. I think I'm going to bank on the dentist. And I'm so grateful I did because he fitted me with this bite plate. He gave me a proper mouth guard, which is goes on the front of the teeth. Yeah. You don't bite down on it, which now thinking back, I'm like, those over the counter mouth guards should be illegal because I think they probably are causing a lot more issues than they're healing. And uh, yeah. So anyway, I love this story because it was so incredible. Um, within 48 hours of wearing this mouth, this bite plate, all the tinnitus went away. All of my hearing was restored and I've never had any issues. So I still, to this day, I don't wear the, the bite, the bite plate I only wore for six months, but I still wear the, the N it's called an NTI. It's a front of mouth, um, uh, night guard. I still wear that because I still grind my teeth, obviously. Um, but all of those incredible, like I was so sad. Like I, it was really, really dark. And, and I try to tell people this story as much as possible because I think there, yeah, there's definitely a lot of people who are grinding their teeth out there and their dentists are telling them to go get those molar mouth guards. And I'm like, that is the worst thing you can do for your jaw and, and your ear canal. So if anyone is having strange issues with tinnitus or vertigo or any kind of, um, hearing loss, and you, you feel like this might be a, you know, you, it feels like, you, you know, this might be an issue and you've been told you grind your teeth at night, like, please look into this. Cause, um, yeah, it's, it was a crazy story. story. Yes, yeah, please. This I think is hugely important. And it was fascinating to me. I, um, so in March of 2020, prior to March of 2020, I was having all this ear pain and, and then the pandemic hit and you couldn't go to a doctor. So mm -hmm. I was doing online doctoring medical appointments and they were putting me on higher and higher doses of phallocyclovir because they thought I had shingles in my mm -hmm. ear because the ear pain was outrageous and and I kept taking this and taking this and taking this. And what I had been doing was putting my dentist off because I didn't want to go anywhere where I had to open my mouth wide in a pandemic. So I was just a wreck. I was terrified to go to the dentist. And finally, I guess over the summer, the ENT said, you know, we're going to just have to bring you in in the fall and we're going to have to go in and do an endoscopy and do all these things. And I was like, no. So I said, you know what? Let me just go see the dentist and ask some questions and see, you know, because he'd said, maybe you need to see the dentist. So I said, all right, I'm going to suck it up and I'm going to go and, you know, fully masked, did the whole nine yards, got in there. And I said, here's what's going on. I have this tremendous ear pain, like piercing, brutal ear pain. And, you know, like you said, it debilitating. It's to be like that is, is a horrible, horrible thing. Mm -hmm. And so he came in and he took his two fingers and stuck them in my mouth. And he said, chomped down on my fingers and the pain was such that I was almost on the ceiling because it was so bad and he said TMJ we're getting you a mouth guard the whole nine yards mine actually goes the whole way back I wear it every single night um I have really chomped the back of the molars so I'm gonna ask about that front one because I have really done a job on the back molars of this thing but as I've gotten used to it and used it I have no pain Mm -hmm. my life is perfectly normal. I have to wear an ugly mouth guard to bed and it's not terribly comfortable. And it did take some getting used to. I mean, he told me he's like, wear it for 15 minutes, an hour, two hours, three hours until you get used to it. And then you will just end up sleeping with it and it'd be perfectly normal. And that is the case. But it's truly, if you've got weird symptoms, just keep asking, see different doctors and, you know, it's same with ADHD, right? Let's just bring this right back around to ADHD. Don't let someone tell you, no, it's not ADHD. You just have anxiety and depression or whatever. That was my story. Keep pursuing it because the fact is you may just not have found the right doctor yet, or it may really truly be anxiety and depression. Like I don't want to diss doctors, but at the same time, you are your own best advocate and we have to take care of ourselves. Absolutely. No one knows I mean, us better than us. 
Well, and this was such a lesson in advocating for me too, because my ENT and audiologist had sort of diagnosed me with this chronic condition that they were like, no, sorry, like, this is just what your life is going to be like from now on. And I, you know, I really was, I had gotten to that point where I was like, there's got to be a source for this. And the doctors were just interested in, in treating the pain. They were just the pain management and they had gotten into this, like, let's just make this as easy as possible where I was like, no, something has to be causing this. And so, yeah, there's so many parallels to that. And, and the way in which so many of us are diagnosed with depression and anxiety without looking into what is the root cause of the depression and anxiety, eh, we're just going to give you a pill and treat that. And, and so this was really, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a frustrating, very lonely journey. And, you know, it was funny because I actually went back to my ENT after I, I had this amazing experience with my dentist and the, and the treatment. And I went back to him and I said, this is, you know, this, isn't this amazing. It was actually GMJD. And it was like, well, and he just looked at me and was like, I've never heard of that. I don't think, you know, he was like, I don't think that's the case. Uh, that makes no sense to me. And I just was like, I left there so deflated because he was not interested in like opening his mind up to like what alternatives it could have been. And, and I obviously don't see him anymore, <laughs> but like, yeah, you doctor you know, time. right. I but it was, doctor. yeah, it was just, it was just, yeah, there's been so many parallels in terms of like how important it is to just keep trying as exhausting and as depressing as that can be. Like if you feel in your gut that it's gotta be something else, you know, yeah. Um, to, you know, it's really is it, it, so important to advocate for yourself and, and keep going. Even when your doctor is, is very confidently telling you, no, it's that it's just whatever he's telling you. I say yes, he, exactly. I know it's pro it's possible that there are two, <laughs> that there are women doctors out there who, who gatekeep as much as men, but, uh, Oh, absolutely. Well. <laughs> they do. Oh, I, um, I could, we could spend just another hour talking I know, about right? stories I've got I know. about women doctors as well. So, you know, uh, and, yeah. I, I want to make sure we spend the next, uh, the, I want to make sure we have everybody know how they can find you and how they can work with you. And, um, you know, where are you, what, what are you doing on the internet these days? Okay. Well, I am found at my website, productivitybydesign.com. If you want to reach out to me to chat about anything, you can do callwithcatherine.com, Catherine with a C, and set up a time on my schedule. Uh, I'm on all the social media channels, trying to build my YouTube presence. And I'm also host of the Uncluttered Office podcast. And Katie is going to be on my podcast as well. So stay tuned <laughs> for that. I guess that's really it. Happy to connect with people. This has been an amazing time. Thank you so much for having me on. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was really uh, fascinating to hear your story. And, and yeah, we got to talk about some issues I wasn't expecting, <clears throat> which, which often happens with this podcast. So yeah, it was lovely uh, getting to know you more, Catherine. So thank you so much. Thanks, Katie.